morning, good morning. Hello, please stand as you're willing and able and join me for number 38 in the gray hymnal, Morning Has Broken. We have the choir here today. Yay, choir, woo! Yes, choir stand. Good morning. Good morning. And it's great to see the choir back again. Welcome. I'm Richard Steele, today's lay leader. I welcome you to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Spokane with special greetings to our online viewers from around the United States, Canada, uh, and elsewhere in the world. Today, we have a guest speaker, fellow congregant, Paul Lindholt, PhD. Paul is professor uh, of English and philosophy at Eastern Washington University, where he teaches literature, creative writing, and environmental studies. He grew up on the Salish Sea in Western Washington, but now divides his time between Spokane and Sandpoint, Idaho. He's a prolific writer on American studies and American literature with some 300 book chapters, journal articles, essays, uh, reviews, columns, and poems in print. His work has been recognized by the Academy of American Poets, the Society of Professional Journalists, and the Washington Center for the Book. His ecological memoir, In Earshot of Water, won a Washington State Book Award, and his sermon today is entitled taken by the sea. Please join me in welcoming Paul to the pulpit today. Whether you are uh, in our sanctuary today or watching from afar, it is here that we join together to create a nourishing religious home with a mission to champion justice, diversity, and environmental stewardship in the wider world or as we say more concisely, to create community, find meaning, and work for justice. Now, please take a few minutes to greet one another.
so we turn now from our informal greetings to formally begin our service by lighting our chalice. The symbol of Unitarian Universalism, of our unity and solidarity, of our openness and inclusion, of our community and individuality. May this small flame be an offering of warmth to those who are cold and alone, and a light to those in darkness. May it be a flame that ignites justice in our world and a beacon of hope to those in need. And may it reflect at least a spark of truth wherever truth has been lost and cast a healthy shadow of doubt where it has been found. For our opening reflection, I draw on a book that I first read 40 years ago, uh, The Sea Around Us by Rachel Carson. Its sixth chapter, The Long Snowfall, vividly impressed me with its perspective. Alien, profound, compelling. Her words. When I think of the floor of the deep seas, the single overwhelming fact that possesses my imagination is the accumulation of sediments. I see always the steady, unremitting, downward drift of materials from above, flake upon flake, layer upon layer, a drift that has continued for hundreds of millions of years and that will go on as long as there are seas and continents. For the sediments are the materials of the most stupendous snowfall the earth has ever seen. It began when the first rains fell on barren rocks and set in motion the forces of erosion. It was accelerated when living creatures developed in the surface waters and the discarded little shells of lime or silica that had encased them in life began to drift downward to the bottom silently, endlessly, with the deliberation of earth processes that can afford to be slow because they have so much time for completion. The accumulation of sediments has proceeded. So little in a year or in a human lifetime, but so enormous an amount in the life of earth and sea. Please, please rise, uh, join us for our chant for the seasons, autumn, uh, number 73 in your hymnal. we gather as a congregation, there are always those who are with us in our hearts and minds and whom we want to wrap in our love and care. We light a candle for them this morning. 
We mourn the people of Ukraine who are dying in the Russian war of aggression. The residents of Marrakesh and surrounding areas suffering the effects of the earthquake in Morocco. And the citizens of Derna, Libya, swept away by floodwaters when two dams gave way in the night above their city. Let us share a moment in silence, embracing, embracing others uh, who are here in our hearts. You are welcome to say their names. Those named aloud or those remembered in the silence we hold in our community of compassion. We now, <clears throat> we now gratefully give and receive this morning's offering, which sustains this community and its mission to the larger world. The smart money's on hollow, and the moon is in the street, and the shadow boys are breaking all the laws. And you're east of, say, St. Louis, and the wind is making speeches, and the rain sounds like a round of applause. And Napoleon is weeping in a carnival saloon, his invisible fiancés in the mirror. And the band is going home, it's raining hammers, it's raining nails And it's true there's nothing left for him down here And it's time, time, time It's time, time, time It's time, time, time that you love And it's time, time Pretend they're orphans and their memories like a train. You can see it getting smaller as it pulls away. And the things you can't remember tell the things you can't forget. That history puts a saint in every dream. Well, she said she'd stick around until the bandages came off. But these mama's boys just don't know when to quit. And Matilda asks the sailors, are those dreams or are those prayers? So close your eyes, son, and this won't hurt a bit. And it's time, time, time. It's time, time, time. It's time, time, time that you love, and it's time, time. Things are pretty lousy for a calendar girl The boys just dive off cars and splash into the street And when they're on a roll she pulls a razor from her boot And a thousand pigeons fall around her feet So put a candle in the window and a kiss upon his lips As the dish outside the window fills with rain just like a stranger with the weeds in your heart Pay the fiddler off till I come back again And it's time, time, time It's time, time, time It's time, 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 time that you love And 
beautiful song. Um, and it's time, time for a story. Come on, children. It's for you mainly. <laughs> Though the adults may also listen, of course. Hi, guys. So uh, the adults probably remember on the news in June, there was a story describing how Sandpoint authorities solved the problem of geese overpopulation. I'm not going to tell you guys about that. That's for adults to read in the newspaper. Well, however, that story reminded me of a fable long, long ago, um, when I was as young as you are in Russia, there was this fable old story that I don't remember the whole part of it, but I can tell you um, something about that. It's about a north, um, the, the, some people that lived in the north, and uh, those people, that community, wanted to cancel, can you imagine? Cancel one season of the year. Can you guess which one? if they lived in the north. What season? Summer. Tell. <laughs> Tell me. What? What do you think? What do you think? Summer. Summer. And you? Winter. You're the winner. <laughs> of course it was winter. But why did those people want to cancel it? You see, they hated the season for several reasons. It was freezing hard for many, many days. And the people had to burn a lot of wood to keep their houses warm. From December through February, the snow was so deep. The poor guys had to struggle getting out. Can you imagine that? And so they wished they, that season, that bad, bad season would never come. One day, early in the fall, the elders of that northern community gathered together to figure out how to prevent the winter from coming. One of them, the oldest and probably the wisest, uh, suggested that they should think a little bit and describe what kind of changes happen in nature before winter. You know those changes, right? Sure. Everybody knows them. The leaves turn yellow, right? And then they start falling off the trees. And the birds, some of them, not all of them, but many birds, would begin their migration to, f they fly south, right? And the bears would go to their dens for their winter nap. Well, not only the bears, but the problem for the people was to decide what to do to prevent the bad season from coming. And they came up with a very funny idea. Can you imagine what idea it was? It was really funny. They decided, first of all, <clears throat> to glue all the leaves to the branches so that the leaves don't fall to catch the birds so that the birds don't fly away, and then destroy all the dens so that the bears stay active instead of taking their winter nap. Yes, funny, isn't it? Yeah. As you understand, the plan to cancel the worst season of the year didn't work. And really, 
There are no bad seasons, though we do have bad weather. But think about it. It is similar to us humans. We may have good days and bad days. We, the people, have our own seasons of life. Childhood, adulthood, years of maturing, and years of decline. Uh, unfortunately, our summers are getting hotter and drier with devastating fires, the sign of a global warming. But still, we can enjoy the bright fall colors, a white Christmas, and beautiful early spring flowers. And in the fall, we begin planting tulips, hoping to be around when they start growing in spring. May we enjoy all days of our lives, no matter the season. And now let us sing the kids to their sanctuary. I sing them out. As we prepare for meditation, I invite you to relax, find a comfortable position, breathe deeply and mindfully, and reflect on these words of scientist, inventor, and electrical entrepreneur, Nikola Tesla. The human being is a self-propelled automaton entirely under the control of external influences. Willful and predetermined though they appear, his actions are governed not from within but from without. He is like a float tossed about by the waves of a turbulent sea. Where 
so pleased to be here and I'm so daunted by how many people I have to thank for this church and this experience first of all Todd in the soundboard Todd Eckloff who has this church and has kept its wheels running so smoothly despite the headwinds and Richard whom I got to know much better today although we've known each other for many years our pianist, whom I learned as a colleague at Eastern Washington University, and Madeline. I'm so pleased that we have her here in the fresh air. She will bring like Tom Waits songs and that. <laughs> Great, I'm, I'm all for it. <clears throat> My theme today is taken by the sea. The sea takes material things and grinds them to a mulch. The sea takes people, too. My message, my theme, might be how to survive death. A book from Roman times by the writer and philosopher Boethius, a book I was assigned to read in college, is titled The Consolation of Philosophy. Its contents made less of an impression upon me than its title did. Long ago, you see, a choppy bay swallowed my firstborn son. This is not fiction. He was 20. The news reports pronounced him disappeared, presumed drowned, missing. In a kind of barter, I swapped him for water. And so the story I have to tell is dark, but it has an uplift, and I'm in a good mood despite the dark message I delivered to you today. My story echoes St. Paul in Corinthians. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, grave, where is your victory? I am long lapsed from the Lutheran church. I was confirmed there but I still have lots of Bible in my DNA despite being lapsed. And I quote the Bible freely, as you see. I self-excommunicated in a fiery letter to my minister after two years of confirmation, hugely embarrassing my parents when I did at the age of 14. <laughs> I still can't believe I had the presence of mind to do that at the age of 14. The loss of my son 
is no tricky riddle. It is no thought experiment, no drill about how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. It is just one of those trials that life flings at us when we are least prepared. When I absorbed the news about my son, I absorbed it like a sponge plunged in water. The blood in my ear sounded like the waves beating on shore, salt for salt, thud for thud. Braden was his name. He was kayaking with his best friend Jim at Larrabee Beach in Bellingham Bay on the Salish Sea. Larrabee is a place that's unusual for its sandstone cliffs that are carved into scarps by the wave action. Those scarps reminded me, when I visited after his loss, they reminded me of veins and ribs. It was early March when he went down, the weather unstable, an ill time for anyone to go paddling. Neither young man wore a life vest as they had been taught, as I had taught him here in the Spokane River. We will stay close to shore, they said. When I got the news, I went numb. I lost track of time. I forgot promises I had made. I didn't show up for work. I briefly even forgot my own name. Braden's name would be lost too, I feared, if he did not show up. Six feet and four inches tall, buzz cut and bullet headed, he plays basketball with skill and flair. Played, I scold myself, played. The next day, both boats washed up across the bay. My ordeal reminded me of some of the biblical teachings I had when I was a kid, especially the story of Job, whom the Lord put through the great trials. He, he smote Job with sore boils. <clears throat> Job's seven children were destroyed also when a mighty wind crushed a house around them. Today, I think of my ordeal as one that taught me to survive death. <laughs> but that's a contradiction in terms. It's an oxymoron. No one survives death, even if religionists try to tell us that we can. One of the foremost functions of faith, it seems to me, is to gain immortality, to survive death, to make ourselves worthy to outlive our biological mandates and emerge intact on the other side. Todd Eckloff has spoken from this same pulpit about a Roman slave, Epictetus, who wrote a book of consolation titled The Enchiridion. As luck would have it, I was reading that book. I turned to it for consolation when my son disappeared. <clears throat> I read it as the days ticked by without good news. The Stoic philosophy of Epictetus differed from Christian philosophy. It differed from Job's faith. To Epictetus, this Roman slave, whose master broke his leg as a form of punishment for misbehavior, to Epictetus, all external events are beyond our control. We should dispassionately accept whatever happens to us. He wrote, and I quote, on a voyage, when the ship is at anchor, you ought to be amusing yourself by picking up a stone or a shell on the beach, but your thoughts need to be on the ship every minute for fear the captain should call and you must leave all your things behind. Maybe the ship captain called my son and he heard too late. Maybe he never heard at all. Or maybe he received his calling and had to leave in such a hurry that he forgot to say goodbye. He was an artist of the pen. Braden 
taught himself to sketch. And this is a very dear memory among many for me. I had to bring him to a graduate seminar where I was doing my PhD because we had no caregiver. And he sat beside me at the age of three with a piece of paper to entertain himself. And he sketched me, he looked at me while the professor lectured. He looked at me and he drew me um, with my wire rim glasses askew, my bedhead hair, my whiskered neck unshamed by blade. I'd forgotten to shave for several days, I think. And he stippled or dappled the whiskers on my, on my neck. Um, so I hold that in, in um, great memory and I use it as a way to post my office hours on my office for many years. Mine is no thought experiment. It is the real thing. None of us can remember our own birth, but every one of us must confront death, both our own and those of our loved ones. When I was a child, my father saved me from death by drowning. We were fishing on a river. I slipped and plunged into the drink. Before the water could sweep me out to sea, my daddy's strong arm unbent and collared me. He hauled me back to wholesome light and air. Two decades later, I asked him for details about that narrow escape. I asked him for the name of the river. Stupefied, he told me it never happened. I did not slip. The ordeal took place only in my head. Maybe it was a dream, I reflected, a harbinger of sun, sudden plunge to come. After Jim and Braden disappear, 100 searchers, all of them volunteers, tramped the beaches, knocked on doors, and plied the waters of the Salish Sea. Presumed drowned, disappeared, missing, the language from the newspapers pounded in my ears. Lacking any certainty or evidence, his mother in Bellingham and I in Spokane could plan no funeral or memorial. We waited in mystery, in misery, in limbo, no closure coming into view. Had I not met Karen Lindholt and had my two very young sons at my side, I probably would have gone bonkers. Poet Walt Whitman in the 1840s witnessed a ship that hung up on a sandbar off Long Island and broke apart in a storm. Bodies washed ashore, most of them Irish immigrants being transported for a fee. I suppose it has always been that way since humans learned to float boats. People take to the sea to find better environs and the sea, in turn, takes the people, sometimes in great groups. There was a writer about the same time in the 1850s, Margaret Fuller drowned only 50 yards offshore while many people watched, and the boat had hung up on a reef, the storm was lashing, they stood on the deck but couldn't get to shore. <clears throat> Ralph Waldo Emerson, my favorite American philosopher, sent his protege, Henry David Thoreau, to the wreck site to find her manuscript, her completed manuscript, on the rise and fall of the Roman Republic. And that's an interesting fact about writers and intellectuals, the manuscript, the book, matters as much as the person. <laughs> she could not leave her family, and her family could not leave her. The shipwreck shed the drowned belongings that scavengers snatched up. History and literature have always given me comfort in hard times. They help me know that I am not alone. They offer what I like to call vicarious experiences, secondhand experiences. They help to cushion the blows of predictable adversity. Not that the loss of a child is predictable. We often say it goes against nature. Kids should outlive their parents. But nature has its own way of regulating our life paths. My reverence for water deepened by the hour. 
Philosophers distinguish between moral evil and natural evil, and I make that distinction for you now. Moral evil, they say, is that which humankind brings to the world. Natural evil is that which nature brings to the world. It takes the form often of hurricanes, volcanoes, earthquakes. I reject both these definitions, however. I believe that moral evil really has its roots in illness and hatred for fellow beings. I believe that natural evil is not evil at all. It just is. Natural cataclysms simply are. They gain moral dimension only when they are human caused, like the wildfires in Spokane and Pend Oreille counties last month. We're still in recovery for them. We will be forever. Those natural evils are consequences of our industrial processes, are, I argue. If we cause climate change, and most of us agree that we do, and climate change causes hurricanes and wildfires, then they are not natural evils, but consequences of our own actions. Was the God of the Old Testament evil when he smote pious Job with sore boils? Or were those boils a natural evil that some beings are prone to by their nature? Skin afflictions, eczema, etc. Questions I don't have the answers to. Native American writer N. Scott Momaday, the late writer, urged, quote, reciprocal appropriation of the land. By reciprocally appropriating the land, beings can respectfully surrender to the landscape, can assimilate it into their own experience. Maybe that's what my son did too enthusiastically. He knows the landscape of Larrabee Beach well now, knows it organically, not consciously, knows it like a fallen leaf knows rain. The Ancient Mariner, the rhyme of the Ancient Mariner is a, is a narrative poem some of you might know from 1798 by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. And that too gave me some, some comfort, or at least a point of connection. The plot of that poem goes like so. A mariner on a ship at sea sees an albatross, a bird of good omen, light upon the riggings of the ship, and he takes out his crossbow and shoots it for no good reason. And all hell rains down upon the crew and the ship, and for days and weeks and months they, they barely survive. He, as a form of penance, is destined to wander the high seas and tell his pain to anyone who will listen. Like that man, I lean on speech. I ventilate my grief. After two months, my sleep returned. It knitted back my tattered sleeves. At a memorial service for Braden, his friends and family speak. I stand and speak. I'm sure at first if I can pull it off. That's kind of like today, talking to a large group about a great loss and unsure if I can pull it off. But I have. My new book at the back of the room tells my story, it tells this story in, in more complete detail. I would like to conclude with a memorized passage by Shakespeare from a little known play of his titled Measure for Measure, and I wanna set this up for you. Um, one guy is consoling another one because the other guy has been sentenced to death. And the speech is remarkable for me. It memorized itself in me because of this final image that I give you a foretaste of. He, Shakespeare, characterized our acquiring of stuff, our gathering of goods like an ass who's back with ingots bows. In other words, a donkey that's carrying us, carrying all our stuff. And here's that speech from Measure for Measure. Be absolute for death. Either death or life will thereby be the sweeter. Reason thus with life. If I do lose thee, I do lose a thing that none but fools would keep. A breath thou art, servile, 
to all the skyy influences that dost this habitation where thou keepest hourly afflict. Merely thou art death's fool. For him thou laborest by thy flight to shun, and yet run toward him still. If thou art rich, thou art poor. For like an ass whose back with ingots bows, thou bearest thy heavy riches but a journey, and death unloads thee. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. <sighs> Let's sing. Please stand. Blue Boat Home, 1064. For our benediction, I offer the words of the Dutch artist Vincent van Gogh. The heart of man is very like the sea. It has its storms, it has its tides, and in its depths it has its pearls too. Amen, blessed be, salam aleikum, and shalom.